So this week we are going to talk about how to include concepts into our work and drawings. Uh, so far we've drawn all the nouns, people, places, and things, but now we're going to talk about ideas and how we can make those people, places, and things convey a message. First exercise I'm going to have you do is draw a, a line through the middle of a sheet of paper. So you have four quadrants, and the top quadrant is going to write self and split it in the middle. And on one side, you're going to have a smiley face. On the other side, frowny face. And you're going to talk about, write down things that you love about yourself, things that you like. So I like making art, cooking, I like eating, I love pets, I love teaching, uh, and I also love looking at art. So these are things that I love to do, um, things I'm proud of, and things uh, I, I excel at. And then things I want to fix about myself. I'd like to travel more. I'd like to make more art, find more time to make art. And I'd like to finish projects. I start a lot of projects, and oftentimes I don't find time to complete them. I'd also like to lose some weight. Next, I'm going to make uh, another quadrant go in, and say community, and I'm going to have a line down the middle, and I'm going to Talk about the things I love about my community, the people, the neighborhood, the groups that you belong to, teams. So the first one is artists. And so I love artists, but the art world can be a little tricky and frustrating. I love cats, uh, but I wish my community would shelter and spay and neuter cats and dogs more. Um, it seems like that's a problem that needs to be uh, handled. Um, and how we treat animals, stray animals especially. As you know, I, I photograph stray cats and dogs. Um, I love my community as far as AUK is concerned. I love the students and the faculty, and I love playing soccer with faculty. And I love my wife and the, her family. And, um, and so those are my communities. Um, some things I'd like to see uh, improved in my community are labor rights. Uh, I'd also like uh, more food options, um, especially now that I'm in quarantine. I miss a lot of food that I had back home in Kuwait. Um, the next one is nation. So I'm going to talk about the United States. And the things that I love about the United States include the, includes the Bill of Rights. Um, and I love art, American art and architecture and academics, um, school system in the United States are, are not bad. It could be better, but I uh, love them. And I love the mix of cultures and diversity in the United States. <clears throat> but there's a lot of things that I'd like to change. So voting is one, making it more accessible, removing the Electoral College, for example. Uh, I'd like to end police brutality. Uh, I'd like to see um, uh, recycling and green energy uh, alternative sources of energy. I'd like to end racism um, and, and ho uh, Islamophobia and the treatment of indigenous people, LGBTQ community, um, Black Lives Matter, and, yeah, and sexism as well. So, you know, these are things that uh, I see in the United States. <clears throat> um, but I also, I also see them in the world too. So, uh, it's, it's oftentimes you're going to have things that cross over. So I'm, in my last quadrant, I'm going to uh, talk about the things I love about the world, about Earth. Again, I love food, but I love all the different kinds of food around the world. I'm glad that there's so many different kinds of culture, and we don't all eat the, exactly the same kind of food. Um, I love working across borders to fight disease, especially right now during the coronavirus. I feel like the world is kind of coming together and trying to stop the spread for the most part. And art. I, of course, love art. And I, it seems like that ends up in all my categories. Um, and I love uh, to, to, you know, think about the things that I'd like to change about the world. And the things I'd like to fight are global warming. Things I'd like to uh, work on are rampant capitalism, uh, inequality, uh, and homelessness. Uh, I'd like to see an end to war, an end to nuclear warheads. Um, I'd like to see pandemics uh, come to an end. 
uh, with greater health care, uh, which uh, is something I'd like to see the United States do, and, and uh, as well as free education. You know, I love academics in America, but I think you can provide more people free education, clean water, food, access to food. Um, see, food is one of those things that uh, I, I have in almost every category, from self all the way up to the world. And then uh, I'd like to see more open borders, allow people to be able to travel more freely, um, but that's going to require a lot more respect and tolerance of other kinds of people and cultures. And, um, and that that's essentially means ending racism, something that I had also in uh, the United States. So one of the things uh, I, I could do to talk about like Islamophobia is um, to do drawings of mosques and show their beauty. So I mentioned I love architecture, uh, and I um, happen to um, be at a friend's house in London, uh, and I was able to take this photograph of the central mosque uh, near Regent's Park, on the outskirts of Regent's Park, and uh, took this photograph from his balcony, and um, so I'm going to do this uh, two-point perspective drawing, but uh, rarely uh, do we have the opportunity, unless we have like a drone or we're on top of another roof, uh, to get this kind of angle of uh, a building. So most of the architectural drawings you did at the beginning of the semester, you were looking up on uh, here, kind of looking in and down. Um, so here you can see I'm, I'm working on getting all my angles and, and lines correct. And so that I can go in and, and add the detail in exactly the right location. And just kind of build, build up uh, all of the structures, and build up my shadows. And then I'm eventually going to get to uh, building all the dark shadows of the trees and the park surrounding the mosque. Um, which is really going to help bring the mosque forward and, and, and set it in front push out in, in the front of the picture plane. Come in and work out and, and deepen the shadows in the front. And the last thing I'm going to do is, is work on the trees that, that uh, come into the front. This dome uh, also is going to get some detail and want to get those, all the windows kind of lined up, but here I'm going to add the trees that actually sit in front, kind of block the view a little bit. I'm going to do that last. But I like to work a little bit from the, the back towards the front um, because you can you can always go over top of things that are in the background. And, and there you have it. That's um, what I'm looking for. You know, the, these last projects, you're, you can do architecture, you can do um, still lifes, you can do portraits, figures. Uh, but I'd also like to see you do a combination of, of these as well. So here I'm going to do a rendering of a um, famous house by, uh, designed by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, one of my favorite architects. Uh, I, I was born in Chicago and, and uh, grew up near Illinois, and, and I ended up uh, seeing a lot of uh, houses that he designed. Um, and so, as well as going to the Guggenheim Museum in New York City, he was a very prolific and very influential architect uh, of the last century. So, uh, I'm going to uh, do this drawing, uh, fill, fill it up with more detail and, and shadow. Um, but what I want you to see is, is how I'm really filling the entire page. Uh, so, so your final projects, I w want you to uh, really fill the picture plane. You know, um, from corner to corner at every edge. And so here I am uh, kind of finishing up the drawing um, and all the foliage around it. Um, you know, I think that it's uh, uh, really important to kind of re-examine uh, some of the things that we, we were studying and, and doing uh, before the quarantine. And, uh, that was specifically the one point and two point perspective. Uh, we kind of had to leave right at, at uh, the time we were working on buildings. So if you want to continue working on buildings, you're more than welcome to. Um, and so I'm actually doing this as a sketch, um, essentially because I'm going to uh, do 
I'm, I'm planning on kind of collabor or combining this with um, the next drawing that I'm going to do. Um, and so next week, uh, we'll have our final video tutorial. But I, I want to take this uh, building and its waterfall, and I want to combine it with uh, Marcel Duchamp's fountain, which was a very iconic piece of artwork in uh, the last century as well. Uh, really kind of changed the whole dynamic of modern art. And it's really a found object. So Duchamp was uh, known for coining the term the ready-made, and it was basically a found object, and he merely um, presented it, exhibited it, with uh, um, signing it, uh, R. Mutt, 1917, on the side, uh, and exhibited it as an original piece of artwork. Uh, you know, and, and so this was a very controversial thing at the time because he uh, was, was kind of breaking ground and presenting things as art that had never been presented before. Um, since then, uh, found objects, um, things that we often discard, uh, have become uh, parts of uh, and elements of art um, by many artists. Uh, so it, it, it definitely changed, I think, the way that we um, look and see uh, objects. And, and then I guess one of the, the big interesting concepts that Duchamp had uh, was, was that um, these objects served a different purpose when they were presented as art objects rather than um, in more functional purposes. So uh, this piece is, is definitely probably his most iconic piece. Um, and I, I saw this copy, this version of it. Uh, there, I believe there's um, at least a half dozen or so versions of this urinal. Uh, I saw this one at the Tate Modern, took this photo when I was there. So here I am just filling in the negative space, darkening it up so that it really has a lot more contrast. But I leave one side a little bit lighter just so that you get the sense of uh, a directional light. And um, probably could push the shadows a little bit more, but I, I like to kind of have that boost of highlight. This next piece is um, based off of Robert Indiana's Love uh, Sculptures which you can find in cities all over the United States and, and, and some in the world. This one's here in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I showed you how I had changed this uh, design to say vote, so where I flip the L and switch it with the V. So I'm using the information I have of this picture to um, uh, move those shapes and get them in the right perspective and get my lines and angles correct. I'm going to darken in my shadows uh, of the depth of this um, steel sculpture and, and then um, go in and, and really kind of bring out my values. Um, so this is an appropriation of a piece of pop art. And, but it is relating to uh, my issue of, of voting. Um, also, so after we did you know, architectural um, drawings objects, we, we move to still lifes. So uh, I would encourage you in your final piece, if you want to do a still life, to do a more elaborate still life. So we kind of limited still lifes to under 10 objects, but what if you arrange something with 10 or more objects? Um, and uh, so this, this drawing I'm trying to do primarily entirely with uh, vertical lines and just build up my shading um, and, these, and leave uh, my highlights empty with n with no drawing in them, so um, I don't have to actually erase. Just kind of like leave that illusion of glass in the highlights. Um, I love pets, so this is my dog Louie Lewis. Um, I'm not great at drawing pets. I don't have a lot of practice at, so this is kind of uh, my first attempt. Um, there's a lot of similarities to drawing humans, but also very much very different. You know, the legs are in different ways and and uh, um, you know the dogs especially are, are all unique by breed um, but also have very interesting characteristics uh, here I'm just really just trying to capture the dark and the light the shadows I'm not trying to do any cross contour uh, but just um, show shade 
uh, build that up and, and then leave the bright side uh, completely untouched, try to erase as little as possible. And then I build up the, the background a little bit so that the white has contrast and can, can pop out on, on the picture plane a little bit more. And then also this little cast shadow that's left by his tail and the cast shadow that he um, sends across the floor. And then, you know, I like to photograph stray animals. So here's um, a cat that I found in Istanbul who uh, came running out of the kitchen of a restaurant and two cooks and chefs came running after him and he was running down the street towards me and I saw the cooks running and he turned the corner and dropped the, the chicken and posed for a moment um, until the two chefs made it around the corner, looked at them, grabbed the chicken and scurried away. But I, I was able to capture this brief moment where um, this cat was able to present its loot to me. And this uh, photograph was actually uh, selected for an exhibition um, that's supposed to be going on right now, but fortunately it was canceled due to the coronavirus. So it had to be an online exhibition. Uh, so since uh, this piece was picked by the curator, I decided to do a sketch of it. So here, you know, we see a lot less of the cat. A lot of, the whole body of the cat is kind of hidden on uh, foreshortened. And so I have to show that perspective. This next cat was in the Al Rafai Mosque in um, Cairo. And this, I call this fancy cat. This cat was uh, actually hanging out by the tomb in the mosque, which has uh, a long uh, history of um, being the resting place for many noble leaders of uh, uh, Egypt and um, other Middle Eastern countries. And um, and so this cat just had this like air of royalty to it, to her. And, uh, she came walking around the tomb and um, walked around my feet and I stepped back and I, I had to take some photos of her. And so here I'm going to spend some uh, attention to detail, especially in the, the tomb itself and, and, um, and then come you know, get that done, get the whole background done first, and then draw her. And then lastly, I'm going to come in and do the carpet. And I, I'm not going to add too much detail to the carpet, just kind of uh, bring a little bit more detail as I come forward. But in the background, I'm just kind of laying in a variety of colors. And then now I'm just brucing in the shadows and pulling out some of the white uh, fur through shadow, because that's, that's the only way to kind of distinguish it. One of my absolute favorite contemporary artist is Ai Weiwei. And so I found this picture of him uh, when I was in Amsterdam. I went to the Cat Museum and I uh, found this photograph of him with his cat. So I'm going to do this one in colored pencil, uh, gray tones. I'm going to do the, um, uh, the cool tones for the shirt and then I'm going to use warm tones for him and the cat. Um, and so it's just really, as you can see, like Focusing on the uh, the folds in the fabric, and then also the hands. Remember, we uh, did some work on the hands, so you can you know have that as uh, a tool in your tool belt, and just build up the value. And then also, I saw this uh, photograph of Salvador Dali, the uh, famous surrealist, uh, here with an ocelot, um, his cat, and uh, his eyes wide open and his um, infamous mustache. So I'm going to build him out from the eyes uh, because I, the eyes are this focal point. I, if I can start there, I think there will be a sense of energy coming from um, you know, his really intriguing eyes. So just building it out and, and then place the cat in so that it feels like they are right up next to each other. Uh, his ear is touching the mustache. You'll notice I'm going to leave some uh, room for the highlights in his hair, how it's slicked back and pulled back. And then I'm just going to build up, build up lots and lots of value. Uh, I start with my HB pencil and I work up to a 6B pencil. And then I come back. I, I come back and add some lighter, high, uh, lighter shadows and allows me to kind of uh, distinguish 
some lighter tones and, and uh, uh, highlights as well. And so there you have it. So those two drawings I think I might uh, rework next week into something bigger. And then uh, I'm going to do a portrait of uh, one of my professors from graduate school who uh, passed away a couple years ago, but he was um, an amazing artist, uh, had a career that spanned many decades uh, from being kind of a poet and writer to a performance artist, to an installation artist, to landscape architect, and, and, and end of his career he was amazingly gifted and very conceptual uh, architect, kind of way ahead of his time. So this is Vito Acconci, um, you know, amazing conceptual artist. Um, so uh, definitely had a huge impact on me and the art I make and how I, I see the world and also how I teach. And so I'm kind of doing this drawing kind of during a, a period of time when I knew him best. And um, it's uh, kind of an homage and memorial to him. And, and so um, I'm going to uh, show you some other artists that do portraiture. And, and often the, the subject of the portrait is really um, the concept. It, it, what's their story? Who are they? So, um, And this week I'm going to have you do two portraits uh, in your sketchbook uh, in full value. So I want you to uh, really push the black as much as you can. So um, this is uh, John Baldessari, who is also um, or was a, a conceptual artist who recently passed away this year. Um, and so he was also a great influence in uh, my life and, and uh, an artist that, whose work I really love. And I think he challenged a lot of uh, things about the art world that um, uh, needed to be expressed and, and, and so forth. So. Uh, his work is really about ideas. It's often about sentences or um, you know, the arrangement of um, images. So here I am uh, really filling up the dark, uh, trying to push that, that shadow as much as possible. Uh, kind of get everything in uh, through, through shading. And, and there you have a uh, first sketch of him. Now I'm going to attempt this other sketch. Uh, so you can see that th this has been uh, two exposures at once. You can see a profile and like a three quarters view. And I'm also going to add uh, the straight um, forward view. And so I'm going to try to connect the two uh, photographs into one uh, drawing and, and uh, sharing eyes as well. Um, this is uh, because I'm I don't know, I've never done this before, but I, I want to try something different, take risks, and, and that's why I'm encouraging you to do. So it might not be perfect. I'm not exactly as happy about this portrait as the previous one, but um, it's it's definitely interesting. It's kind of a conversation starter. and I think it also kind of uh, shows this motion, this movement from uh, forward to side or back and forth. Uh, so I'd like to talk about some artists that really inspired me. The first one is uh, Fong Bui, who is um, an artist and writer uh, who founded the Brooklyn Rail, which is an alternative art magazine. And he's interviewed and written about many famous artists, art writers, curators, and so forth, like Yule, Julian Schnabel, Rizio Catlin, uh, David Lynch, um, uh, as well as... Uh, photographer um, uh, Andre Serrano, uh, David Graeber, who is a, a very uh, well-known writer and theorist. Um, he's also done a few photo, a uh, few drawings uh, from a photograph of uh, the artist Ai Weiwei, who I mentioned um, earlier. I did a drawing of with his cat, uh, as well as. Uh, Iranian artist, artist uh, Shireen Nashat, uh, and writer Eleanor Hartney, as well as uh, two artists, uh, Tim Rollins and Chris Burden, who passed away in the not too recent um, past. Next artist is Tatyana Fazlalizadeh. And so I'm going to show you a video of her work here and let her
The Stop Telling Them to Smile project is a street art series that is addressing gender-based street harassment. It looks like drawings of women with text underneath them, and the text is usually a quote from the woman. And we have a conversation, a very open, candid conversation about what they experience walking down the street. Usually these conversations are with just regular everyday folks, everyday women, people who are not necessarily artists or activists, but people who just simply want to say, this is what happens to me. But it speaks to her experience with street harassment and what she wants to say to people who harass her in the street. So some examples would be, my name is not baby, I am not here for you, stop telling them to smile, women are not seeking your validation, you know, all of these things that are kind of affirming this woman. And I we paste that work up in the streets, on corners, kind of around the country. So over the years, the work has grown from being these small pieces of paper that I put out in the street to, you know, some really large-scale murals that I've done in cities across the country. I was not expecting for it to become what it has become. I began the project just with my own portrait and two portraits of friends. It was an experiment. I wanted to talk about street harassment. And I just made a couple of pieces, went out kind of timidly in the street one night and put them up. And then a few days later, it was just kind of all over the internet and I just kept going. How street harassment makes me feel, you know, it depends on what happens and in the moment, but it's usually anger or frustration. Sometimes it can be scary. And, and I think that making work out of anger is good. Um, I know that some people don't think that, but I think that anger is a legitimate emotion. And I think that if you are angry about something, you want to change it. I was like, I have to do something about it. So I'm gonna make some art about it. I'm gonna put it in the street where it happens to me, where street harassment actually happens. I'm gonna put it in that environment. And initially it was very much so for myself. It was very much just for me, like, I don't like this, I'm gonna do something about it for myself. And then as soon as you do something like that and you tell your own story, someone else is gonna to relate to it. And I mean, of course, right? Of course I'm not the only woman who experiences street harassment. And so of course the, the response was gonna be huge because every other woman was just like, yeah, right? I've realized over the years that I can, that I'm an artist and I'm a creative person. Um, and what matters to me is the message that I'm trying to put out with my work and the audience that I'm trying to reach. And so because of that, I'm not beholden to one medium. I'm not stuck in a box. I don't have to do an oil painting. Um, when I realized that, I was like, oh, I don't have to do an oil painting. I can do a drawing. I can do a poster. I can do a video installation. I can do, um, I can do whatever I need to do in order to reach an audience that I'm trying to reach. And so when I realized that, I became more creative. That means that I am sometimes a commercial artist. That means that sometimes I'm a fine artist. That some, sometimes I am an experimental artist. Um, sometimes I'm not creating a tangible piece of art at all. Sometimes I'm writing, sometimes I'm, you know, I'm doing all these things, um, but they are all a part of the practice. They are all a part of my career as a whole. And that's exciting. I find that very exciting, not feeling like I have to do one single thing. I think being a professional artist is, it's like running a small business and it's like you have to motivate yourself. You have to be your assistant, your secretary, your accountant. You have to do all of these things. And then you also have to like be creative and make good work that the world loves, right? So it's just like kind of like, okay, um, maybe I can do one of those things today, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's being an adult, you know? It's being an adult who draws for a living, and that can be, that can be a challenge. It's kind of like, okay. Um, I have to buy health insurance. Um, 
And then I have to do this drawing and hope that people buy this drawing so that I can afford to go to the dentist, you know? It's all good stuff. There are challenges that, you know, I, I just face every day and I just, I, I do it because I love to do it. I love to be an artist and yeah. And probably the most famous street artist is Banksy, even though we don't know his name. So uh, I'd like to look at some of his sketches. Uh, you're probably familiar with his stencil work. Uh, it's widely seen the past um, 20 years now that he's been doing graffiti. Um, so you can see kind of the evolution of his work and, and uh, the process. Um, he works kind of quickly, but uh, he also has, has done some um, drawing work that uh, I think, you know, is, tells quite a message, has a, quite a story. Uh, so during quarantine, he photographed this uh, of his, supposedly his bathroom. Uh, and it says with the caption, my wife hates it when I work from home. Uh, rats have often been a theme in his work. Uh, he also has donated a picture titled Game Changer, which uh, depicts a young boy sitting on a floor playing with a nurse uh, superhero. He donated this to a Bristol hospital. Uh, the Batman and the Superman action figures lie in a basket. Meanwhile, the nurse figure uh, with a cape and a face mask. Here he's um, appropriating Vermeer's uh, girl with a pearl earring um, he, with the face mask and using uh, the found object on the wall as the, the earring. Um, I believe he painted this near on the hospital as well. Next, I'm going to show you the work uh, of street artist Swoon. I was born in Connecticut, but I grew up in, in Daytona and Florida. And then I ended up in New York, yeah. New York had a huge impact on me. I felt like just the landscape alone, seeing graffiti and seeing the collage and the layering and the input of people. My first series that I ever made was this series of prints on tracing paper that I just wanted to interact with those layers, the sort of naturally occurring collage in the city. And so I made these drawings on tracing paper because I wanted the colors and other forms and stuff to show through. That was the idea, and then it just evolved from there. For one thing, I just love portraiture and I love to draw a human presence. I felt like I was drawing something that could almost be read as an x-ray of that person of their mind or of their life or of their experience so that you have this portrait but then you also have all that's contained within their emotions, within their body, within their narrative. This series is called The Anthropocene Extinction. It's this moment that we're in. We're going through such a catastrophic loss of species. We're losing like over 200 species a day. The impact of human beings on the planet is like totally unparalleled. There's an image of a temple. There's hundreds of drawings of various animals. There's a demon, which is kind of like the devouring principle. And then there's a woman I had recently met and who had lived nomadically in Australia. Her culture has died and her way of life has now totally vanished. She was just kind of an amazing woman. I just wanted to myself try to understand it better and also try to communicate it. And I'm certainly always thinking about connecting with people and about opening perceptions trying to reach an emotion and then trying to have that moment of connection with people when they see it. We're sitting in front of my piece, Submerged Motherlands, and the Cantor Rotunda on the fifth floor of the Brooklyn Museum. This is kind of such a unique space in the building that I wanted to make something that really fit into the space and rose up into the space and kind of addressed the whole space. So first what you'll see is we built a 60-foot tree and it's sort of intended to kind of be the sort of nesting docking spot for um, these sculptural rafts, which traveled down the Hudson River and also on the Adriatic Sea to Venice. Every element of the rafts is homemade from the flotation to the sculptural elements. About 30 people at a time lived aboard them and traveled for a few months each summer in 2008 and 2009. Also included is a structure that's kind of like a gazebo, kind of like a small temple. It's made up of portraits. There's a portrait of a friend of mine with her new baby, and there are portraits of my own mother in her life cycle. And on the inside, there are honeycombs and wasps' nests and various decorative elements that you can pass through and hang out in. Well, the very first thing that I had to do was get in touch with an engineer and show him my design and be like, is this insane? Is this dangerous? Should I not do this? 
we had to construct a lift point um, that the building didn't already have. And so it's been pretty interesting um, working within the structure and sort of figuring out sort of what's already here and sort of trying to understand the architecture and how we can work with it. And then we just spent weeks like tearing and shredding and dyeing fabric with like instant coffee, with paint, with fabric dye. We just kind of like experimented with everything cutting out paper leaves and building up these kind of roots and paper macheing them and putting the dyed fabric onto them. There's also a lot of washes of um, fire extinguisher paint around the outside, which was, it's kind of the best tool ever. That was really fun. Well, it took about two days and probably like 70 to 80 gallons of liquid just loaded into pressurized tanks and sprayed just over and over again for over the period of a couple days and let it dry and continue spraying. and. Um, that was really fun. And originally, I had been thinking a lot about climate change. Um, the, the rafts, when I first started to create them, I was thinking a lot about climate change and rising seas and kind of dislocation of communities. And then Sandy hit. And so it seemed like a really kind of a, an important time to continue that kind of thinking just as a way to sort of like meditate on all of our anxieties about this situation, bringing this thinking kind of to the forefront and trying to tangibly like get our sort of hearts and minds around it. That's always what I'm doing as I'm, as I'm thinking about sort of environmental issues. My name is Caledonia Curry. I also go by the artist named Swoon. I started making work outside while I was in school. I would actually sell things out of my apartment to people who like managed to find me and then like their sister-in-law and then their neighbor and like I would just somehow like get through six months that way and be like okay this is working. Then I got this email from MoMA and they were very like can you stop by and I was like what do you mean? <laughs> they were like just bring a couple things. I remember that I biked all that stuff there on my backpack and it was like sticking like eight feet on my backpack. And it was just funny to me at that time to be like, oh, here I am bringing my work to the permanent collection at the Museum of Modern Art on my bicycle and my backpack. It was just funny anyway. <laughs> Pretty shortly thereafter, I did my first solo show with Thy Trojects and everything changed. In the fine arts world, I've done a lot of projects. In the street art community, I think that's where I'm most well known. Street art had this kind of explosion recently. The way that I feel about it is that it is like a healthy practice of a healthy city to have people making things and putting them outside and like being a part of the visual creation of their neighborhoods. When you're sort of like looking at your life and your society and the problems that we're beset with. I think that for me, I always really struggled with how to be who I was as an artist and yet be able to interact directly with some of those issues. My relationship with image making is such that sometimes the only way to really move through something is to make work on the subject. This last year when my mom passed away, she was struggling particularly hard with her addictions and mental illness in the couple of years before her death. And so I had sort of started directly dealing with some of that stuff. And so a whole section of the imagery that's in the Brooklyn Museum is, is both about that struggle and then is about the process of her illness and death. And then is also just about kind of thoughts on motherhood and sort of creating images of of nurturing that were perhaps missing from the original picture. That piece had such a personal significance about this most recent period of my life, and so it felt like the show was just able to have a more complex narrative. I do kind of feel like the function of the artist sometimes can be to be this, to be an, a mental and an emotional sort of processor for some of these thoughts, and then to try to share that. Um, and so for me, Taking on some of these subjects is, is my attempt to do that first wave of processing about what is it, how do we understand this psychologically, how do we understand this emotionally and instinctively and in all these other ways besides logically, because we're going to have to understand it in all of these ways if we're going to find ourselves in a position to really take it on. When I was in New York City, I went to the Armory Show, and the piece that really caught my eye was Cynthia Daniels. 
uh, Delilah's Gone, named after Johnny Cash, uh, one of Johnny Cash's famous songs. And it presents the portraits of powerful women of politics and entertainment uh, throughout history who have been subject to harassment and violence and scrutiny, um, especially because of their place in public eye, um, activists and um, uh, as well. So, uh, and then they're really closely cropped, so you can see it fills the picture plane. It goes off the edge of the corners. Uh, so her work is often a series of paintings, uh, and they're meant to be exhibited together and remain together as a single work of art. Uh, so aside from that, this most recent body of uh, portraits of 24 women, uh, she's also uh, done a lot of uh, landscapes. And, um, and then, uh, you know, these trees. Uh, and then lastly, uh, I'm going to show you a series or an entire body of just guns uh, that she has done as well. Next artist is uh, Joel Daniel Phillips. Um, so he does these life-size uh, drawings of uh, homeless people. Um, and you can see there uh, by scale, you know, the, the life-size drawing really kind of makes uh, these people seem more humane uh, or more human, uh, makes them um, more relatable. Definitely that giant scale allows him to, you know, really show every detail. Uh, and then when you look at it much smaller, the resolution is, is just extremely amazing. It allows you to get this really photorealistic quality. Um, but it's also showing a community of people that are marginalized and often um, looked down upon. And then here you can see he's also uh, drawn small homes and, and trailers. Um, so, you know, consider how you can put people and architecture together in, in a uh, drawing uh, composition. Um, I find his work quite fascinating. Here are some still lifes that he's done of garbage. Uh, so one of my issues that I talked about was the need for recycling. And so, um, you know, these are really beautiful, but they're also, we know they're, they're something really dirty, disgusting, uh, garbage. And, and you can see uh, each person's contribution now added to the larger pile of uh, garbage and tires and so forth. These are dilemmas that we have to deal with. Um, and then he's also uh, done work about um, kind of the oil industry and, and uh, the pollution that's caused, the uh, fires that have been caused, uh, how it's changed the landscape. And, and so um, showing the air quality and so the, this work is all done in charcoal and graphite and, and really uh, high contrast, really kind of uh, very dynamic and energetic. Uh, it's, it's, it's eerie feeling, but um, it, it's certainly getting the point across. And then here he is um, depicting, uh, you know, some nuclear bomb explosions. So I, you know, I mentioned earlier that I'd like to see an end to uh, nuclear war. Uh, so with this piece, he uh, goes on to say that as part of a series of U.S. nuclear weapon tests known as Operation Crossroads in 1946, a 23 kiloton nuke called Baker was blasted 90 feet underwater uh, at Bikini Atoll. Uh, the explosion caused a tidal wave that reached over two miles high. In this particular test, the second and last detonation at Operation Crossroads was the first to be tested underwater, and the result was so devastating that the third blast, Charlie, scheduled to go off in 1947, was canceled because naval ships were still having trouble dis uh, contaminating from Baker's test. Many of these ships were subsequently towed back uh, to the Hunters Point Naval Shipyard in San Francisco, California and de-radiated by a process of sandblasting in the dry docks on site. This unfortunately cr uh, created contamination uh, that still exists today. So, uh, you know, as you can see, he's, he's drawn frame by frame of this explosion. 
And I think what's what's interesting is it goes back and forth. It's almost like um, you know one of those uh, boomerang videos, right? Uh, or or like a vine, um, and it, it it allows you to kind of think about what if we had gone back, what if we reversed decisions, and and, um, and also like how could we replay history? How can we uh, redo and, and learn from history, uh, you know, from the mistakes we've made in the past. And uh, yeah, it's it's really explosive. I'm going to show you some other animations next week. This next artist uh, is Robert Longo, and his larger-than-life charcoal drawings of men and women dressed in business attire, uh, fail, fail, flailing around and collapsing. Uh, really launched his career in the 80s. Uh, he was kind of fascinated with the gestures of figure and reminded him of punk musicians and fans dancing. So what he would do is he'd get his friends and he would uh, throw objects at them and he'd tie ropes around them um, and, uh, and he would photograph their reactions and their movements uh, and then he would project these photos uh, onto really large, extra large sheets of paper and then he drew over them in great detail. So he calls himself an image thief. Uh, his intent is to invent, call, and kind of recycle um, images that are iconographic. And uh, he, he tries to pull this all from our expansive culture of visual uh, knowledge. And, um, and he likes to comment on the idea surrounding the image's potency and its production and circulation. He essentially mines the collective unconscious of our culture. And uh, especially images that have themes of aggression and violence, whether it's natural violence like these waves and tsunami uh, waves, or if it's something uh, man-made, um, uh, militaristic. Uh, so uh, he also was using images of atomic bombs um, similar to what Joel was doing. And, um, uh, you know, like to, to really kind of uh, show the destruction and the power and, uh, you know, of anything that's going to have impact. And uh, similarly, you know, he also drew trees, which their branches and, and um, uh, stems out into the, the page. So usually trees are not a very interesting subject when they're all alone, but if you can get it to actually fill a whole page like he does here, um, you, you know, there, there's a lot of impact. It's very intense. And, um, or here, the entire page is black except for the eyes showing. And it's uh, definitely allows for um, this contrast, it allows for this focus. Um, and you can also see here the scale of his work is, is quite large. These tigers, they did a whole series of tigers. Um, I think uh, tigers have been a popular topic uh, during the quarantine because of Netflix. Um, but, uh, you know, you can, you can certainly draw animals. Here uh, he's done a series of great white sharks. So this kind of uh, intensity coming towards you uh, and the possibility of something um, attacking you. And then, you know, his series of work has um, evolved into uh, machines and vehicles and, uh, and the, the clean lines of those, but also notice how they fade into the black. And then the machines become larger, these uh, fighter jets, which um, you know, are, are meant to be killing machines uh, and uh, uh, you know, cause destruction. Uh, so here he's showing you know, our, our solar system, Earth and the sun and the moon um, and planets as well, and, and using footage uh, that is available to him from NASA, which is is all completely uh, uh, you know free fair use, um, and and 
these striking images of the cosmos. Um, this next series of work um, uh, is, is essentially these homages to uh, abstract expressionists from you know, the late 40s, uh, 50s, and early 60s. Um, de Kooning and Lee Krasner, Franz Klein, um, Joan Mitchell, Robert Motherwell, uh, Barnett Newman, Jackson Pollock, Ad Reinhardt, uh, Mark Rothko, to name a few. Uh, so Robert Longo actually got permission from the artist to recreate their work. And the only one that he didn't get uh, permission from was uh, Franz Klein, um, but he uh, exhibited it with a not for sale sticker. Um, um, and then this last body, the most recent body of work, has all been uh, kind of centered around Black Lives Matter, uh, the, the murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, that kind of started these protests. And so he's using found images uh, from the, the protests, um, the clashes with the police, as well as professional uh, athletes, football players who knelt or who came out with their hands raised. Um, so this is probably his most, I think, uh, directly political work. Here are refugees. Uh, and so uh, very politically charged work. And um, I think it's, it's, it's definitely uh, more narrative of uh, the time and less symbolic uh, as his previous work. And so that wraps it up. I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of ideas you can come up with uh, and, and implement those into your drawings.